one second. All right, so is the screen visible for everyone? Yes, sir. Great. So uh, for, uh, for those people who were not there in yesterday's class, uh, we just started this uh, first topic or first chapter in the uh, in AS physics. It was it is measurements, and it's very. Uh, we started with very basic things. Uh, what are physical quantities, base and derived quantities? We discussed those. Uh, we discussed prefixes, and then we were we just really started uh, estimations. Right? How do we estimate values and so on? How can we predict which estimate is realistic or not? So that's what we'll be uh, focusing uh, on today on estimates and we'll continue from that uh, further. So is there any question were there in the last class? Is there any question in whatever we did? Uh, anything that you might maybe went through it, it at a later time and you had a question or anything of the sort? No. Right. Okay. So, uh, in fact, we did not even cover uh, a lot. So, uh, I'm. Uh, I did not expect any question as well. But, okay. So this is what we were doing, right? Uh, we were, we were talking about uh, estimates, and this was just an example problem from one of the past papers, and uh, we are asked which estimate is realistic. Now we'll go through all of these options, right? So this is option A, then we have more options, option B and C. And for some weird reason, option D is, it's on this next page, uh, some error in making the notes, uh, but anyways. So we'll start with option A and we were doing this. So uh, the, uh, the, the first option is that the kinetic energy of a traveling bus which is traveling on an expressway is 30,000 joules. So let's check if that makes sense, right? So, well, uh, any, uh, a bus is really a heavy vehicle and a heavy vehicle would travel from anywhere in between 50 to 80 kilometers per hour on an expressway, right? Which you can convert it into uh, meters per second and that's 13. Point eight to round about 22.2 meters per second. Okay, so that's an, that's an estimate of, a, of the speed of a bus, uh, which is a heavy vehicle and it's traveling on an expressway. So we, we can take, uh, we can really take the average of these two values and use that as the speed, right? So we can say, say that the velocity would really be the average of these two values, which would be the sum of these two values divided by two, which is uh, approximately uh, 18 meters per second. Now, we have an, an, an approximation or an estimate for the velocity of the bus. So let's check uh, when we use this uh, velocity, what mass do we get? So we know that the kinetic energy is half mv squared. So we're given that the an estimate is 30,000 joules. So they're saying that maybe the kinetic energy of this type of a bus is 30,000 joules. So let's do that. Let's put that in this kinetic energy. So that's 30,000 equals one by two mass times uh, the velocity, which is 18 meters per second squared. Now just factor this out for M and you'd get two times 30,000 joules divided by squared of 18. And if I compute this, you get um, 185 kilograms. Now, here lies uh, the reasoning. This is the mass of a bus 
that we get from this approximation of estimation of the kinetic energy. But does that make sense? Uh, this mass would normally be uh, two people mass can be, it could be equal to 185 kilograms. But we are saying that it's a mass of the bus and all the passengers inside the bus as well, right? Can that be uh, 185? Of course, it's, it cannot be 185. 185 kilograms is uh, too less of a mass, right? It's, it's, and hence we'll say that this option does not make sense. So is that clear? Why did I negate this option? Yes. What steps did we do? So, okay, perfect. So the steps and everything, the thinking behind uh, working this thing out is clear, right? For everyone? Yes. Amazing. Okay, so similarly now let's look at the next option, which is uh, this one, B. And it says that the power of a domestic light is 300 watts. Well, straight out of the bat, that's just, uh, you can say that this is not a reasonable estimate because we know uh, in our homes, usually uh, we find uh, bulbs that are anywhere from 20 to 60 watts, right? So at maximum, maybe you can have a domestic light uh, running at about 200 watts or 100 to 200 is also maybe okay, but 300 watts is very high for a domestic light. So is that clear, right? Yes. Perfect. So that is also not going to work. Now let's look at this one. The temperature of a hot oven is 300 kelvins. Now kelvins is the important thing that you should be focusing on because uh, 300 kelvins, it's not degree Celsius. So we'll have to convert this into degree Celsius. If you are familiar with uh, temperatures in degrees Celsius, then you would have to see what it is in degrees Celsius. But th there are some people who are very familiar with kelvins and they would immediately know that this 300 kelvins is actually room temperature. This is actually room temperature. But for, uh, for those who, uh, work in centigrades, degree centigrades, then they'll just convert this and you, you'll see that uh, you just subtract uh, 273 degrees from this. So this gives you about 27 degrees Celsius. That is, uh, that is of course uh, room temperature, right? So that's just room temperature. How can that be temperature of a hot oven? So that's not going to work as well. So with this, we move to our final option. And normally you would just pick this because none of the other makes sense. And that's the last option. So save time, pick this and you know move on. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll uh, see why is this the correct option or why does this make sense, right? Okay, so the option is that the volume of air in the car tire is 0 0.03 meters cubed. So let's see. Does that make sense? Here we have a diagram, which uh, at least tries to resemble a wheel or a car tire for us, a car tire really. And so this part, uh, this one that I'm highlighting, it's hollow, right? And you have, uh, this part is the filled part. And so therefore that's the reason we have these two different radiuses. One is an inner radius and the capital R is the outer radius. So let's see, we'll have to make some estimates for the radiuses for a car tire. Now, you can, uh, you'll also have to make an estimate for how thick this tire is, right? So if you look at it in three dimensions, it, uh, I'm going to try to draw, of course I cannot really draw, but this is, the thickness, right? So I'm sure you get the point, the thickness of a tire, right? So we'll have to make an estimate for the thickness of the tire. Let's call that T. And we have to make estimates for the inner radius and the outer radius as well. So a good 
estimate for the thickness of a tire would be anywhere from 10 to uh, 20 centimeters. You could take an, a value uh, in between these two. So we'll just take it to be 15 centimeters. And if you convert that, if you write that in meters, so that's just 0 0.15 meters. So you'll have to, the thing about estimates is you'll have to use your imagination. You'll have to think uh, which value, which number really makes sense. So you have to be familiar with the centimeter scale or even meter scale. And then it's relatively okay uh, in making uh, good enough estimates, right? It also, the, the, the point here is also that, I think I mentioned in the last lecture as well, these questions are really given as MCQs and, and this one is relatively a weird MCQ, but the, uh, the MCQs that you find in your, uh, normally in your papers, exams, they're not so uh, difficult for these uh, estimate questions. So you're given values which really, uh, which are really absurd. And then there's one value which really makes sense. So if you make a good enough, a rather good enough, it does not have to be perfect or even close to perfect, a rather good enough estimate will work. So now uh, this is approximately a good enough estimate for the thickness, uh, inner radius and outer radius. Now, uh, Note that this we have over here is this volume of the air tire. A tire can be assumed as a cylindrical uh, shape. Uh, do you agree with that? You can assume the a tire as uh, the geometry of a cylinder, right? So we can make that assumption. And making that assumption, the volume of a cylinder is given as pi r squared. Let's use a curly r, r squared h that's the volume where in this r the only volume that is contributing to the tire is the part that is filled right that is you can say it's solid the hollow part does not contribute to the volume obviously right so we need to figure out what is this length right this length and that would be the capital R minus small r. So that's the r that I'm looking for. So does that make sense? Yes. All right. So uh, we need to make an estimate that is good enough in a sense that the difference in these two values are really the square of the difference in these two values is um, will work for us. We, we cannot really say that this is equal to uh, this r. Uh, we'll just use this as pi r squared minus r squared and h. So it's the difference between the square of these two values which really matter. So you have to pick values whose difference would suit a tire really. So you can take, you can suppose that the capital radius, the capital R basically, the uh, outer radius is uh, anywhere from 30 to 40 uh, centimeters. Let's just pick 40 centimeters, which is 0 0.4 meters. And small r would then be, you should now look at this. It's If this is 40, if this is 40, then small r, maybe half of it or not even half of it. In fact, it should be a slightly more than half of it, right? If you look at this diagram, it's, it makes sense, right? So maybe you can take 30 centimeters, for example, and 0 0.3 meters, right? Now let's just put all these values inside uh, this expression. And uh, what we get is pi 0 0.4 squared minus 0 0.3 squared. Don't forget the units, you have meter. So we'll just bring that out. And then we have 
the height or really the thickness in this case, which we assumed uh, to be 15 centimeters or 0 0.15 meters. So the, the, the units we get a meter squared and meter, so we get meter cube, that's the unit part, and you do the calculation mathematically and you get roughly about 0 0.03. And so you put the unit with a 0.03 meter cube. So which makes sense? Now, maybe you might have gotten 0 0.025, 0 0.026, 0 0.02123, or 0 0.04, or 0 0.035. 3638, those answers uh, are also relatively closer to this value. And so you would just, that's the correct option, right? So does this make sense? Yes. All right, perfect. So is there any uh, question whatsoever for anyone? No. All right, so no questions, perfect. Okay, so then we'll move on to errors, really. And we'll talk about uh, precision, accuracy, random and systematic errors. Uh, random errors are really those type of errors where you can not really assign any cause to these errors. They are entirely, as the name suggests, they are random. Uh, they do not really follow a particular pattern. So for example, let me give you an example. If I have a graph and the graph has some points on it, right? So we have X axis and we have Y axis. And the points on this graph, for example, you from an equation Y equals MX plus C, maybe you expect the graph to have a straight line, but when you were doing an experiment in lab, Maybe there was some random error in your values. What I mean by that, I'll just show you. Uh, and so you got the points, you took some readings for X and Y, X got the answer for corresponding Y. So you just tried to plot them. And maybe your points were like this. Now you would expect a straight line and you might, you'll draw something like this. We see that there are some points, for example, this one, this one, and this one, this one, this one, they do not really lie on the line itself. Now the cause for that is, or the reason really for that is that there was a random error in the experiment to begin with. And you can, reduce these errors by repeating your experiment. So you take more and more and more values in the lab and you average over all those values and you get a value and then you take, okay, so I'll pick that particular point. And, it's, and if you do that, then that particular point is more likely to lie on the straight, on this line, right? So basically you have really reduced the random error in the value, in the measurement really, right? So that's random error. And as you can see that it says, it causes your readings to scatter about a true value. So the, so the true value was really supposed to be on this line, but the values, these points are really scattered around uh, this true value. So does that make sense? Yes. Good. Okay, so next we have another type of error, which is systematic error. And it is really a type of error where you can assign a cause to this error. The measurements, the readings, they really follow, or the, these type of errors, they actually follow a pattern or a trend, you may say. And so with that trend, you can assign a cause that maybe this was the reason for this particular pattern to appear in my measurements. And it really uh, would, on a graph, if you were supposed to see this error, you would really see it as, uh, so again, this is your x-axis, this is your y-axis. On the graph, it would 
really appear as starting from, uh, well, they're not starting from the origin really. So for example, that was the origin and this is your line. Now, if you see that it's not starting from the origin, that means that there might have been a systematic error in the value, in the measurement, or really in the system or the device instrument that you are using to perform the measurements. For example, you could think of an example. Uh, of, I would not really call it a waste weighing scale, uh, a mass scale. Let's just give it a name, mass scale. So you stand on it, right? And let's suppose that it's not set to zero. Instead. It, it starts from maybe five kilograms or so on, right? Let's suppose it's an analog one and you, there's a little knob that you would have to adjust and set it to zero before you stand on it. So if you're already starting from five kilograms, then when you stand on it, it would add that five kilograms to your weight. And this is also known as zero error. So the scale was not initially set to zero which it should have been set to so that that zero is really your reference point from which you can measure your values for your weight or mass in this case. If it was not set to zero, then if you were to take several readings, step on it, uh, step away from it, again, step on it, uh, you know, just to find an average value of your mass and you plot it, so you're really, be starting at zero when you were not stepping on it. So it would really be giving you this, uh, some error, which would be say, okay, uh, it's at when you were not really standing on it. So at this zero point, your mass, it's showing you five kilograms. For example, if it was, uh, if zero error existed as five kilograms. So is that clear? The, the idea of systematic error? Yes. Okay, perfect. So it's again, it's just this thing. It's an error which really causes your readings to deviate in one direction from the true value. So the true value might be uh, something and the readings are moving in one direction. So for example, if your mass was really uh, 75 kilograms, but it has deviated in this direction, which means in the positive direction, and appeared as 80 kilograms because of five kilograms of zero error, right? So that's really your random and systematic errors. Now we can talk about precision and accuracy. Uh, before getting into the, you know, the statements of this, uh, let's see what do they visually look like. Uh, let me see where I can draw. Okay, I just made his head small. Let's take him over here and just try to do it over here. So consider that you have a dart board and you this is the center, which is uh, known as the bullseye, right? And you throw your darts on this. Let me use uh, this red color, for example. And you throw your darts on this board and they land at this point, this point, um, or let's just say that they land near uh, to this point, this point, this point, and something like this, right? Now, how would you define uh, this situation? In terms of accuracy and precision, does anyone have any uh, clue about it? What can I really say? This black mark is really the point that I wanted to hit. And these, this is how, let's just get rid of that for now. This is how my darts really landed. So what can I say about my precision and accuracy? I'll say that my accuracy was relatively high and the precision was low. Now, why? Because Precision is really, uh, when I throw my darts, it does not I want to hit. It takes into account how precisely my darts landed. What it means is how close 
my darts landed. So if the darts that you have thrown have landed closer to each other, that means that uh, this thing would have would have Hello, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So, yeah, so what would be happening over here in terms of precision and accuracy? Let me just define precision and accuracy. Precision is really when, uh, like I just said, how close my darts are landing to each other. And accuracy is how close my darts have landed near to the target that I really wanted to hit. They might not be closer to each other, but they have to be closer to the target that I want to strike. So in this case, you can see that these darts in red are relatively closer to this point, black point, which is, let's just say that's the bullseye. And that's what I was aiming for. So. In this case, what I have is high accuracy, but relatively low precision. Let me draw another uh, uh, figure. Let's draw something like um, where you might have high precision. So let's say that this is the bullseye and here we have uh, some darts that are not really close to the target that I want to hit, but they land somewhere here. So all of these red dots are where my darts landed. This, In this case, my precision is really high. So I'm very precise with my darts. When I'm throwing the darts, I'm very precise throwing them closer and closer to each other. But uh, the accuracy is really bad because I'm very far away from this um, bullseye, right? So in this case, I have a very high precision, but really low or very bad accuracy. Now you could also have a situation, which would be a really good situation, by the way, that if your dart, if you throw darts and they land something like this. What is happening over here now? Anyone from the class in terms of accuracy and precision? Both high. Yeah, both are really high because you're very close to your target and all the darts that you have thrown, you have thrown them with such good precision that they have landed so close to each other. And so in this case, uh, both of them are very high. Right, and really that's what your accuracy and precision is. So that's what it is. And uh, you can see in this uh, diagram, the same thing is really demonstrated, which uh, in terms of uh, errors, random and uh, systematic errors and similarly precision and accuracy as well. So you can have a look at it. If you have any problem, you can uh, let me know. And we can move on to the, the next topic, really. So is there any uh, question at this point from everything that we have covered so far? No. All right, so uh, before uh, proceeding, let me just quickly check how much time do we have left? Apparently less than five minutes, but let's see how far we can go. Uh, any uh, comments about the speed of the lecture? Do you think it's too slow or is it okay? I don't think it's fast. So maybe it's too slow or it's okay. Or you can let me know if it's fast as well. I think it's slow. 
yeah, it's uh, so that's what I think as well. But really, we're uh, just um, starting. Uh, everyone has to agree uh, with uh, with a particular speed, really, because I had not. I, I, I can understand that at the moment it's relatively slow, but there are some people as well who might say that it's okay because, you know, of course there are different types of students. And so that's under, so everyone has to agree upon uh, one speed. I guess these things are relatively easier. So I think we can just quickly, uh, you, you know, skim or really through all of this and, we'll spend more time on, I guess, tough problems, uh, tough chapters, really. For example, electricity is one of them. Anyways, uh, so let us uh, let me give you a problem and try to think about this. It's a problem from uncertainties and maybe you are aware of it or if you're not, but we'll go through it. So suppose you have any number or any quantity and the value for that quantity is let's suppose 2.0 and it's in millimeters and there is some error in this value so you just say that it might be it might deviate from 2.0 by 0 0.1 either to the left or to the right that's what this plus minus is telling you and it's in millimeters now suppose that i ask you to compute the percentage error or percentage uncertainty in this value? How would you go about it? Any, uh, anyone from the class? Is there any, uh, any idea? Does anyone have any idea? It doesn't matter if it's wrong. Uh, if there is anything that you might be thinking right now, maybe like, you know, do this or do that, uh, feel free to speak. It doesn't matter if it's wrong. I is the question? Yeah, sure. Ask, ask away. Sorry, uh, you're you're saying you're asking me what the question is. I sorry, I thought you were saying uh, you have a question. Sorry. So the question is really that you have a quantity and its value is two point zero, and it has an error of plus minus zero point one. So it can, it the value two point zero might be one point nine or it could be 2.1 as well, or maybe 2.0. So there, there are three possibilities. That's what this thing Im implies, right? So add 0 0.1 minus 0 0.1 from this, or just have it as 2.0 millimeters. What is the percentage error in this value? Any idea? Any thing, how should I go about this problem? I will divide 0 0.1 by 2.0 and multiply it by 100. Exactly, perfect. So what you do is exactly, so it's really something like uh, dx by x into 100%, where dx really is the error in the value and x is the value that you have. So the expression, the, the you can really say the formula for this goes a bit like this. And you're just, you just want the percentage error. So 0 .1, 0 0.1 divided by 2.0 into 100%. And so you would get 5%, right? So that's how you would go. Uh, you, that's how you calculate uh, percentage errors by taking the absolute value of error. By that, I mean, just if there is a negative sign, just make it positive. So you take the positive of error, absolute value of error, divided by the value that you have and just multiply.